welcome to the Bumblecast. I'm your host, Ian Flynn, the Bumble King, and joining me as always is my Bumble co-host, Kyle JCRB Krause. Hello, folks. I am here. I have been here this whole time. I've been here. I've been sitting here for this whole, the whole week, just waiting. Like I've been in stasis for a week, and Ian finally unfroze me. Thank you, sir. No, oh, absolutely. I, that's I appreciate your dedication. Yeah, I just literally pause. I just literally pause in place. It's like chaos control for a week. <laughs> I just sit here. <laughs> doop, doop, doop. And we wrap the show. I say, "Bumble chaos control." You mm-hmm. just kind of go, "No, wait." And then uh, we do the thing. And then I'm asleep ish for yeah. a week. And then I wake back up and boom, back to the show again. That's how it goes. That's my life. This is what you wanted, wasn't it, Maria? <laughs> a bumble cast for only a few hundred to listen to. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Before we get started with the main contents of the show, a little bit of news. Uh, Drogoon updated last week. New pages new lore pages so once again if you've not given it a read just yet please do so over at drogun.com that's d-r-o-g-u-n-e.com if you also uh read web comics on webtoon we're on there as well free to read and subscribe there we do need the eyes because if you're not part of the you know upper echelon the folks who are pulling in a few million views a day you kind of get buried so you know I mean, we're still young. We're still young on the service, but give us a little bit of attention, a little bit of love. It would be appreciated. Yes. Also got to announce a bunch of stuff involving Aether Studios, but we actually have a priority queue related to that. So rather than be redundant, I'll just wait till we answer that. Okay. I guess that's one way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We got some, we got some Aether news. And it's uh, it's good if you've been if you saw it. It's no joke. It's not an April Fool. It is real, and it's pretty cool. So stick around for that. What about you, Kyle? You got any news? No. Okay. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I do. <laughs> On this uh, most recent episode of Nitro Game Injection, my other show, which is all about video game music, I actually had a uh, really cool interview. With Nick Marinelli, who's the guy who was, he was head of MAGFest from, say, 2014 to 2019 or something like that. Or he was involved oh, with wow. MAGFest. And he became the uh, the head of it for for a while. So I talked to him for about half an hour on the most recent episode. And we chatted about, you know, our shared love of video game music. And about MAGFest and about uh, his new video games and concert initiative. So... That was really cool. So check that one out. That's Nitro Game Injection uh, episode 451. It's on there. Or uh, just head on over to KNGI.org and check it out. So that's cool. about that's it. That's the only news I have. It's good news, though. It's interesting. News. I think it's interesting. It is. This is very good. It's a very cool interview. So go check that out. After you do that, though, and you want to ask us a question, Send us an email at bumblecast at yahoo.com. Tweet to us on Twitter at bumblecast. Comment on any of the YouTube videos. And if you're a patron, please head over to the Ask Q&A channel over on the Discord. If you want your question answered sooner rather than later, become a $5 patron over at patreon.com backslash bumblecast. Or give us two coffees. That's $6 US over at kofi.com. That's ko-fi.com backslash bumblecast. Be sure to include your name and your question because otherwise it's just going to be a free donation to us, which is lovely. We accept those as well, but you probably want your question answered. So please do send that along. Also, before you ask your question, please, please, please check the Q&A master list over bumbleking.com backslash bumblecast. It is a comprehensive list of everything that has been asked. So just check that first. Had a small rash of folks who didn't check that or the FAQs over bumbleking.com. You know, save yourself the wait. Read up on that first. Then come back to us. Indeed. All righty. Without further ado, let's hop into the priority Q&A, starting off with one from our good buddy, Scruffy Matt. Who? Oh, yeah, I don't know him. He's a new, <laughs> new guy. <laughs> You're all our good buddies, just so you know. But I, I always put good buddy in front of Scruffy Matt just because, I don't know, it fits. It's fun. So, anyway. Hello, boys! 
There have been some abysmal video game adaptations of licensed properties over the years that didn't seem to understand what the franchise they were portraying was actually about. There was an SNES game for the sitcom Home Improvement, which had you recovering stolen power tools from dinosaurs because of reasons. There was that infamous Atari ET game, which involved you... Uh, what was that game out about again? And perhaps saddest of all, there was a Godzilla game on the Game Boy that featured a tiny chibi Godzilla trapped in a tiny labyrinth with other tiny chibi monsters that you could punch with a giant fist that did not, did not match Godzilla's tiny proportions, and the only way to progress to the next room was by destroying all the boulders. And then there's Superman 64. Well, at least those guys tried. So my question to you this week is, what other terrible video game ad- adaptations can you recall being disappointed in because they had very little, if anything, to do with the source material? Well, to be fair to a lot of those developers, they were probably under an extremely tight crunch with a very limited budget and probably no time to actually understand the source material <laughs> and with probably really restrictive licensing oversight or none at all. So either too much guidance or none. So a lot of those cases might just be they did the best with what they could. And nine times out of ten, your licensed games are not great. I distinctly remember that Game Boy game you mentioned, though, because that was one of my most stark losses of innocence. Because the cartridge art is Godzilla. Yeah. The Toho monsters. And it's like, all right, I'm going to play Godzilla. And no, it's some kind of it's a puzzle game when you get down to it it's just a puzzle game and not only is it a matter of you know destroy all the boulders you can screw it up you can fail the puzzle and you have a hard time limit because if you don't solve it fast enough Ghidorah flies onto the screen beelines to you and kills you you cannot fight him so you know if you don't get it right the first time you lose if you can't figure it out you lose if you can't get around the other monsters running around the stage you lose it's an exercise in frustration i hate that game (laughs) but i can't think of a ton of games that i played to be honest because most games that i played it was either first party stuff or it was i guess quality licensed games i mean i played jurassic park i think everybody played jurassic park but each console had a different version of it Okay, the Genesis so, version, I should yeah. specify. Okay. And that was hard as balls, but it was still... You, know, you got to play as the Velociraptor. I mean, come on. How <laughs> cool is that? It looks good, but, I mean, it's not a great game, really, when it comes down to it. Not a great game, but at least it is in the style of, like, Jurassic Park. Like, you can look at it and say, oh, yeah, this is clearly a Jurassic Park game. It's all... The, yeah. They use the license correctly, in a sense, but, I mean sure it was a really difficult game but it still it looked like jurassic park it sounded like jurassic park it was jurassic park so i mean uh i played aladdin and lion king and those were excellent yeah um lion king brutally difficult but other than that mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we're not talking about how gentle it was but it was you know it was on brand yes uh there was an x-man game that i played where you know the fact that there was a small detail that if you were playing as Wolverine and you held still for a minute, you would actually regenerate health. You know, it kind of played fast and loose with all the various sci-fi elements of the series, but that's, that's X-Men. I mean, <laughs> was that, was that adamantium rage? Or was that a different one? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, it was X-Men 2 Clone Wars, I think it was. Oh, okay. Okay. Not adamantium and, rage. I mean, that... The fact I never really played the first one all too much, except for at a friend's house. But, you know, it got really meta with you where you completed the Mojo verse stage and you couldn't escape unless you physically reset the system. Right. Yeah. It's like the kind of fourth wall breaking thing that would fit. So I don't know. All the licensed stuff aside from Godzilla that I played seemed really spot on. Yeah. I don't know if I really played much. I don't know if I played much licensed stuff myself as a kid, at least, and I never really. I mean, other than like you know, Lion King, Aladdin, stuff like that, stuff that was pretty, a pretty, de- pretty decent representation of the source material, at least. Like, I never played the Home Improvement game. I don't think if I, I knew it existed, <laughs> which 
I mean, <laughs> as a kid who really loved Home Improvement and it was a family ritual every week, <laughs> I would have played that game and probably loved it because I'm I'm dumb. <laughs> but <laughs> as a kid, um, yeah, like. Going the other way around is pretty easy. Like you can look at stuff that's been adapted from video games and be like, "Oh yeah, that's that's clearly all yeah. wrong. That's yeah. clearly bad. That's clearly, yeah, it's, they clearly weren't paying attention." But they, I don't know. There's there's definitely a lot of licensed games that are mm, just disappointing. But I can't think of any off the top of my head that I remember growing up so much because I didn't. I'm like you. I stuck with. A lot of Mario, a lot of Sonic, and a lot of just generally first party stuff. Um, I guess I remember playing the Top Gun game on the PS1. I don't remember that game being particularly bad. It's not like the NES game, which is stupidly hard. But at least the <laughs> NES game is a game where you fly around in an F-14 shooting stuff down. That's accurate to the movie. So that even that's not like a bad licensed game it's just a bad game <laughs> uh, so i'm trying to think like what's what's a game that's just so wrong i don't know even et honestly if you read what howard scott warshaw wanted that game to be and how it was supposed to play and the ideas that he had for it it's actually a pretty decent uh representation of et I mean, as as much as you can get on a very limited system like the Atari 2600, it was just not enough time and only one person developing it because that's how it was back then. I hope that answer is uh, satisfactory enough for you, Scruffy, and if it's not, too bad. Let's get going here with another question from Noni. Ian, just wondering, what do certain characters do on their days off? What does Eggman do if he's not plotting schemes? What about Starline? What does Cream the Rabbit do when she's not single-handedly saving the planet from disaster? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, that's a wide net. Right, we'll go with the ones you named dropped specifically. I imagine Eggman, it's very hard for him not to be plotting something. I think that's just what he do. But I imagine he kind of tinkers around his place, fixes a few things play some video games, trolls people online because that's what he does. I can imagine he could do like very deep dives on Wikipedia or whatnot and correct all the articles in ways that he thinks they should be corrected. Starline, meanwhile, is undoing the corrections, not realizing who's doing all of this. <laughs> so it's so Eggman is essentially his like on the off days he's just doing pretty much what he does in boom. <laughs> Yeah, sure, we'll go with that. <laughs> so <laughs> he's just boom, boom, Eggman, but he's actually a, also a horrible monster, unlike he is, where he is in Boom, where he's just kind of a bumbling fool. <laughs> yeah, I'll fun with that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Starline's been trying to write the great musical of our time for the past 10 years. He's, he has that one hook that's really good, but... He just can't put it together, and part of it is he's distracted by other projects, but, you know, one day, one day the news will strike, and he will be able to sing his soul to the world, and until then, he'll just figure out how to conquer it and subjugate everyone. Uh, Cream, I imagine, is constantly just helping people. She's baking things and making deliveries and looking after Chow and tending to the flowers, just being this unbridled ball of positive constructive energy that makes me tired just thinking about it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> uh, Sonic just lays around doing nothing that's kind you of his charge man if you're gonna run at Mach 1 for the fun of it every now and again you just gotta sit down and chill <laughs> yeah yeah maybe cream pumps iron with knuckles <laughs> that's what she's doing with her ears with her ears yeah each ear has a dumbbell and just yeah. lift yeah. Lift. Yeah, she needs to support big, so she's with her ears, so she's got to lift. Got to lift with her ears. <laughs> uh, next up, we got a question from Saturn Flicky. 
Have you ever considered using Chaos Gamma in the comics? He was still functional at the end of Sonic Battle, after all. There's not a whole lot to the character, but it's a cool design. Uh, he's actually been cut from two pitches so far. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, know, you know me, I love to mine my obscure Sonic trivia stuff, and yeah, I've wanted to find a way to use Chaos Gamma, and it's come up short twice over now. Just not for any particular reason other than he's not really crucial to the story. It, he he doesn't really bring anything other than the fact that, oh, hey, look, it's Chaos Gamma, <laughs> which is not a huge selling point. And so when things need to be revised or streamlined or whatever, it's like, where can we cut? Oh, yes, the robot that has less personality than Omega. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's fine. I, I'm, I'm kind of on a vendetta now that I want to get him in there just because i don't know maybe he'll ride into battle with sticks or something yes <laughs> uh, we need sticks we need her badly uh, scurvy pirate hog has a question first of all wanted to say that i'm really hyped for the classic sonic comics you and the rest of the idw team are going to release later this year can't wait for seasons of chaos and the rest but in regards to classic sonic it got me thinking you think that having certain characters being classic exclusive limits some potential? Like, on the one hand, I can understand partially why Sega would want to do this in order to help give classic and modern their own flair and separate the two, if you will. I'd personally say that the style and tone of the story is enough to separate classic from modern, but anyway, reason I ask this is because, as things are now with classic exclusive characters, and with how Sega seems to want to keep Classic Sonic as an anniversary thing, and more or less means that we can only experience some of these characters only like once every fifth year or so. If Classic was, however, allowed to coexist alongside Modern, regardless of anniversaries or not, I don't think it would be an issue then, but what are you thinking? I, it's not really an anniversary thing that I'm aware of. I don't think it's been a conscious decision beyond generations. I think that's just how the timing goes mm -hmm. mania um, so yeah so um mania was an anniversary thing oh yeah mm -hmm. but even then i none of, none of the notes or directions i've gotten have implied that classic is you know strictly an anniversary thing i think that's just how it happens to fall modern is the brand right now and classic is still a fairly new sub brand offshoot i don't know how you want to describe it uh i just think it's you know still finding its footing and still becoming a thing so uh in terms of restriction yeah no i mean it kind of sucks that we may never see a modern mighty and ray but at the same time one of the things that modern suffers from is character bloat and if everything is on the table you know, as fun as it would be to see 32X style Chaotix again, what do they, do we really need that in classic gameplay? You know, part of the fun of the Chaotix now is that they're these bumbling detectives and you're not going to quite get that with the limited classic storytelling style. You can make a case for either or, but I don't know. Right now I'm kind of in, more interested to see how things are handled going forward before I really start saying, oh, I really wish we could do this, that, or the other. Let, let Classic finally figure out what it is, because right now we've got Mania, more or less, to go off of. Mm -hmm. Let, let's get a little more Classic as a defined thing before we start really passing judgment. And sure, that might take a while, but you know, we've been here 30 years and it doesn't feel like it. it it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> here's a question from diane w you know on a previous bumblecast episode you said that six of the seven chaos emeralds were the wrong color well they are gemstone appropriate names for colored barrels which is what an emerald is the green emerald is emerald obviously the cyan emerald is aquamarine the blue emerald is blue goshenite or maxite uh, red emerald is scarlet barrel or bixbite red barrel but this name is discredited purple emerald is morganite or purple barrel the yellow emerald is Golden Barrel, or Heliodor. And finally, the white emerald is Goshenite, if that makes any sense. Does that clear up anything regarding what colors the Chaos Emeralds are meant to be? 
see, that doesn't help anything because they're still Chaos Emeralds. They're, sti- they're still called Emeralds collectively, yes. It's not Chaos Barrels. It's Chaos Emeralds. So that's like saying uh, Heliod... Like, that's like saying an Emerald is a green Heliodor. You know, that that doesn't fix anything. Sure, Barrel can be multiple colors, and you're absolutely right in that regard, but it's not like, here, I found the Bixite, and I found the Heliodor, and I found the Emerald, and I found the blah, 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 blah. It's, I found the Emerald, which is technically not accurate. It's not something worth getting worked up over at all. (laughs) I don't even remember saying that, to be honest. It's just an Uh, observation, you know? I mean, yeah. They're, They're just Chaos Emeralds. There's... The chaos chaos emeralds don't exist. They're not real, so they can be whatever you want them to be, <laughs> or whatever Sega wants them to be. So the chaos I mean, emeralds got... are come. They come in multiple colors. But sure, they're called chaos emeralds, but they, they're just called chaos emeralds. And they're just called that. It's a bizarro sci-fi series. It can be whatever it wants. Exactly. Yeah, they're just. Multi- I mean, they're not even your traditional emerald cut. They're more like diamond solitaires. So yeah, yeah, exactly. They're they're just they're just that's they're just called chaos emeralds. They're just called emeralds because that's what they are called. That's just what they are. <laughs> I mean, eh, if you want to get into the what these emeralds are actually made up of, I don't know, adamantium, whatever, <laughs> dragon no, balls. Bad. <laughs> Adamantine is a metal that is an ore. Yeah, I know. Gemstones are crystals. Yes, I suppose could be. Uh, I can't remember any. I can't remember a fictional gemstone. My brain is broken. Don't tempt me to get all pedantic on our imaginary things now. <laughs> <laughs> eh, oh well, you know what's not broken? This question from off. Tangle, Whisper, and Jewel walk into an arcade. What games do they play? Tangle immediately goes for the nearest fighter arcade cabinet and she manages to blow through very few quarters because she's actually pretty good at it. She just gets a little too aggressive sometimes with her fighting and, you know, when really should be deflecting or dodging or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, Whisper isn't particularly fond of it at first because it's very loud and very bright and there's a lot of noises from a lot of directions. That's not usually her thing. But then she'll find one of the light gun games and it's just racking up a perfect score. <laughs> uh, Jewel agreed to come along because these children need supervision and it's not really her thing. But oh my goodness, they have ski ball. How quaint. And she spends the rest of the day on ski ball. <laughs> you see, I imagine Tango playing a two player fighting game by herself. The tail on one stick and uh-huh. on the other. Uh-huh. Yeah, there you go. All right. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I dig it. I dig it. <laughs> or, or I imagine her playing a racing game like Daytona USA, and she's singing along to it the whole time, bouncing <laughs> in her seat because she's just <laughs> so enamored by this game with its ridiculous music, and she loves it. That's something I imagine Tangle doing. <laughs> I could see that too. Changing gears her using her tail. Yes. <laughs> I don't see her being particularly successful in a driving game. No, but... no, not at all. But she's singing along and bouncing and having his fun because you know, fun colors and big old car wrecks and things like that. It's it's mm-hmm. fun mm-hmm. and it's exciting and there's lots of music and <laughs> silly things. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And fighting games. And fighting games for sure. She's, I don't know. She, she seems like she plays everything. Imagine her playing like a DDR like game, and she's just again, she's got her tail using her tail on one <laughs> on one pad and her feet on the other. <laughs> she's just bouncing all over the place. Ah, uh, oh, Tangle, you lovable scamp. Here's a question from Andrew D. Did you ever want to give a civilian names to other robot masters like the ones we got? Blues, Rock, Roll, and Tempo? What sort of civilian names would you have come up with for some of them? There seems to be a musical theme to all the names, so I'd imagine it would have eventually gotten difficult if we gave a civilian <laughs> name to every one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, because I feel like that's not what the robot masters are about. Rock was built to be rock primarily. That was his function, to be a little boy. Same with roll, same with uh, tempo, same with blues. Right. They're alternate forms. They're you know, robot master-esque working forms, we'll just say. 
are th- part of the function. The name is, is associated with what they can do in the field. The robot masters aren't meant to be individuals. They're meant to be tools. They're supervisors of lesser machines and they serve a function. So Gutsman's name is Gutsman because that's what he is. That is the function of the Gutsman model. Super gutsy. To, yeah. You know, Cutman is Cutman. That is his function. He cuts. And there, there is a degree of they have their own personalities and identities, to be sure. But that is one of the things we kind of touched on in the Archie series, is that it's a emulation of personality, of individuality. It is part of the coding that comes with the tool. It's like if you, I don't know, had a power drill that had a sassy interface or something. That's just the way that it is. And it isn't until you get to the reploids that you have something closer to individuals in the truest sense. Now, that's my interpretation. That's me trying to rationalize robot masters versus reploids. Uh, that is very much, you know, up for debate. That's just my take on it. <laughs> yeah, and then you got things like Skull Man, where you're like, "What? <laughs> what are you? <laughs> <laughs> what? What is your function?" <laughs> I mean, when we have the uh, Wily bots who opted to be reprogrammed or to be shut down, that was kind of touching on it because Flash Man says, "You know, that's who I am. That's what I am." Okay. Quick Man, right? Quick Man. Um to be anything else to go by any other name would not be quick man so yeah skull man's job is being spooky <laughs> i like it <laughs> skull man's job is halloween <laughs> it's an important job here's this question from d gamma how far ahead do you know what artist is working on a story i figure who gets to draw is not in your power at all all in editorial but do you find out soon enough that you can potentially tailor a script to the artist's strengths? Is the answer different between Archie and IDW? Times when a fill-in artist gets brought in notwithstanding, especially with IDW? Uh, most of the time, no. I don't know going in. Um, There's actually something I ran into when working on the Archie book because I had worked with Tracy for so long that I started scripting with him in mind as default. And then something would happen. He would, you know, be shifted to another book or somebody else would have to be brought in and it's like oh i'm not writing for him anymore they're going to read and interpret this in a different way ah panic (laughs) um uh, in the rare occasion where i do get to know ahead of time i do try to write to their strengths uh with worlds unite uh we knew that we had tyson on board for the final act and Tyson is just a machine. I, I don't know how he does what he does. <laughs> or Ben Bates for the third act of uh, Worlds Collide. And it's like, okay, I know what they can do in terms of visceral renderings. Right. Let's, you know, I'm, I'm going to risk breaking their hand and making them swear off comics altogether forever. Because I know they're going to be able to render these absolutely bonkers scenes at the absolute apex of what they can be done. And just, and I wasn't wrong. They look just mm-hmm. stupendous. Yep. Uh, when we did the mega drive stories, you know, Tyson was on board for those too. It's like, okay, I know his style of humor. I know his style of action, you know, build towards that. And of course it was phenomenal. So when, when I get that heads up, I, I do try to cater to them a little bit and otherwise I'm just kind of writing in the dark and just make sure that I do the best script I can and hope the artist and I sync up for the most part. Nice. And we got a question from Madeline M. Hello. Have all the various designs of tales workshop and plane hanger been the same place or are they based on each other? The one in IDW seems to be close in design to the one in rush. Many of the designs have a small pond next to them, as seen in IDW, Rush, and Adventure 1. Um, Tales has multiple workshops, and some are inspired by game areas, some are not. Uh, The one we saw just before the Metal Virus kicked into high high gear was an original design, 
kind of inspired by others, but it was strictly comic based. The one during the last minute was supposed to be his lab strictly out of Sonic Battle. Um, and it just seems like the guy's got little hobby shops and hangers dotted across the map, which for somebody who you know kind of follows Sonic around and Sonic goes wherever he wants, whenever he wants, that makes enough sense. You know, Tails adventures with him a bit and then you know, <laughs> Sonic runs off and Tails has to find somewhere to sleep. Okay, well... Good thing I've got this little bungalow over here. (laughs) Okay, we just saved the day, and Sonic said, thanks, look after my plane for me. Okay, I'll I'll do that for you, buddy. Um, (laughs) Good thing I got a hanger over here in this cliff face. (laughs) Thinking ahead, because somebody doesn't. Yes. (laughs) He's, uh, He's got a side hustle in real estate. (laughs) <laughs> apparently <laughs> surprisingly our final priority question this week comes to us courtesy of Papadripopolis tell us all you can and want to about your rivals of Aetherwork what are you doing how's it, how's it been doing it etc please and here we come full circle <laughs> so rivals of Aether for those of you who don't know is a platform fighter a la Smash Brothers. Uh, fairly popular. It's on Xbox and Switch and Steam, I believe. Yes. And it's begun to branch out. They've got a card game on mobile now called uh, Creatures of Aether. And the first game has a story mode. And it was written by the creator and lead dev. And it it's serviceable. It works. But he has big visions for where to take everything. So he wanted to bring in someone who can manage stories and their a, a broader universe within a franchise. And he came to me because apparently I seem to know how to do that sort of thing. <clears throat> so my primary duty with Aether Studios is the narrative director. My job is to look at rivals and creatures and the other titles that are in production and make sure everything is cohesive within its universe. Uh, If the story is established as this, how does that affect things that come before or after in the timeline? What is the timeline? What is the history of these characters? Where are they going? What are they doing? How does this all fit together so that when you indulge in the Aether universe, it feels cohesive? Uh, Part of that is the... Tales of Aether comic series we've got coming out this year, which will follow Claren, who is one of the playable characters, and her story, and <clears throat> excuse me, how that fits into the greater Aether storyline. And hopefully that will do well, and we'll be able to tell more stories about more characters and really get into the lore of it, because there's only so much story you can tell in a fighting game. Sure. The other game that I'm that they're developing that I'm working on is Dungeons of Aether, which is a roguelite, uh, which will have four playable characters, each with their own story. And then one overarching story to the game itself. And I'm going to be writing and developing that to make sure that it fits with comic plans and sequel plans and the whole shebang. Where does it fit in the greater Aether universe? And I wanted to write a video game for the longest time. And I finally get to do that. And so, yay, that makes me happy. (laughs) But they've got a lot of stuff in development at various stages. It's really, really interesting what Aether Studios is planning and what they're doing right now. They're just a great group of folks to work with. I'm very happy to be part of that team. So you are the writer of Aether, then, one might say. Indeed. Indeed. Nice. Nice. This is a, a game that I've known about for a while, the original, but uh, never really got to dabble in it too much before, but uh, I want to, and now I really have an excuse to do so. <laughs> <laughs> They're so. also very, very involved with their fan community mm-hmm. to the point where four of the most well-rounded, most liked fan-created characters are being added into the main canon like people were inspired by the game they created 
characters with their own unique move sets and stories and whatnot and allowed them to become part of Aether, which I think is just neat. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of the old uh, Mega Man uh, Robot Master contests, magazine contests, mm-hmm. where you'd submit a Robot Master to get potentially uh, selected to be made it into an actual Robot Master in the game. Yeah. So it's kind of like that, except this time you you, you got to do all the work. You got to make the <laughs> character in the game yourself. <laughs> yeah, then they they'll do it. All the, they give you all the templates, all the things you need yep. to make sure that they fit into the series and it's very encouraging it's very open and fun and accessible and i like that a lot it's a nice philosophy i like the yeah i like the idea of it being like an open moddable game like that it's the steam workshop idea behind that is that's awesome i really appreciate when games give you the freedom to just do do with them to just tinker with them to your heart's content that's so awesome. And then it's even cooler when like it actually those actually become canonically part of the game later on. So very cool. Speaking of very cool things, we're going to take a quick break, but then we'll be right back with more of the Bumblecast. And we're back to get into the standard Q&A, starting off with none other than Tick Tick. I'm curious, who came up with the decisions on how the world would be post-apocalypse in IDW? It seems like in issue 33 in Bad Guys number one, the world is business as usual, as if forces Neo Metal's Revenge and the Zombot Plague were just footnotes and not world-spanning events. Whose idea was it to distance from the darker elements and implications that the first two years of the comic were building off of forces? In short, what are the consequences to the world, and what decisions led them to not being there? Well, with forces specifically, Sega told us not to reference it. They said, game's done, move on. Uh, Neo Metal was a very self-contained sort of thing. Sure, it was a big epic fight, but it wasn't, I wouldn't call that a world-spanning event. It was just kind of an adventure Um, as for following up on metal virus, I don't know if there was a direction from above or whatnot. Uh, but I know Evan and, you know, grain of salt don't want to speak for her, but I believe, but I believe she wanted to focus on more smaller character centric moments rather than dwell on the big world spanning macro view type stories. Yeah. Which is good. That's a good balance to kind of because we've had the big world expanding story going on for went on for a while. So you know, bring it back down, bring th- bring things back more into a smaller smaller sphere. So I like that balance. Next up, question from PC the Unicorn. I absolutely love Worlds Collide, and it's one of my favorite comic events for a large number of reasons because of how much I loved it. I was really excited about the sequel series Worlds Unite, but after reading it all those years ago, I have some questions about it that have been on my mind for years. Why exactly did it cross over so many other games and wasn't it and wasn't simply a four-way crossover between Sonic, Mega Man, Mega Man X, and Boom? With how many characters were brought in from other games, it kind of made the story overcrowded, with three or four issues dedicated to recruiting characters alone. Why didn't the entire Sonic Boom cast partake in the crossover? Seems like a missed opportunity to see the Boomcast meet their Archie counterparts. Did you want Worlds Unite to be longer than 12 issues, considering how cluttered everything was? And where was Chip during the entire event? He kind of just disappeared during the entire thing. Okay. Um, Number one, we couldn't use the Boomcast. They were off limits. Uh, We could use Sticks because she didn't have a modern Sonic counterpart. And we wanted to have kind of equal representation between the four main franchises so the joke was we had fastidious beaver and comedy and comedy chimp because they were nobody extras and they were the <laughs> trifecta from the boom world we didn't want sticks just by her own and those two were comedy relief characters anyway so it was easy to kind of write them into the background um the multiple franchises part of it stemmed from other talks Archie was having with Capcom at the time, 
I don't know how much detail I can go into it, but they didn't pan out, obviously. But there was some talk, which is how things expanded in one direction. And then I think I was told to bring in other franchises for the third act just to go nuts with it. I want to say that's how we did it. it it's been a while. I can't be 100% certain, but I can't imagine that I would have gone that crazy with power. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was, I think it was uh, for, to go bigger and louder at the end. So it wasn't just a complete retread of collide, you know, bring in all the toys, put together a list of what that, I think that's what it was. I was told to put together a list of franchises that I would think would be, uh, big crowd pleasers and to see what would get approved and what wouldn't for just this big razzle dazzle finale. And I don't know, we've, we've covered it on the show a few times that unite suffered in its structure for a few reasons, but um, one of them probably being too much in the third act. We, and I've seen folks say, well, why didn't you space it out better throughout the whole arc? You had so many issues and that's because I don't think we could get the license for them beyond that third part. So the question is, you know, then why go to the trouble of it? And it's like, hey, hindsight's twenty twenty, man. I can't say that all decisions were made by me or that all of them were the right decisions. But I don't know. For what it is, it's a fun little romp. It is not as tight as Collide. I will definitely grant you that. But it has its some fun moments here and there. Yeah. Making comics is not easy. Let's just say <laughs> making anything really is not all that easy. As for Chip, that was probably for the sake of simplicity. He wasn't allowed to be used. Oh yeah, he was decidedly cut. Yeah. Okay. You remember? No, I don't. It's been a while. Yeah. Okay. So Chip was expressly denied access to that crossover. Weird. Oh, well weird because weren't you using him at the time in the comic itself and the main yeah comic but story? that that was a bit of a nightmare in and of itself because sega of japan was treating it as unleashed had already happened so they were very confused as to why chip was even around and we got notes like the guy temples are lost forever under the ground they can't show up again or it, there was this very big disconnect over you know we're doing the comic version of the story and Sega of Japan was of the stance that no, this is how the story has happened. We're just making allowances for you to bring back some elements. It, it was, it was an interesting, that, that whole thing was a bit of a gauntlet. Very, very beginning reboot era was rife with challenges. We'll say. Sure. Yeah, makes sense. Next up, a question from Godzilla. Who would win? King Ghidra of King of the Monsters versus King Ghidra of King of the Monsters, but each, he each head's personality is replaced by Sonic in the center, Shadow on the right, and Silver is Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Could the hedgehogs adapt to their new draconian body and take down the golden demise? Or are they doomed to succumb to infighting? That's oddly specific. It's one heck of a question. <laughs> and it is one of the worst mental images I have had. That's <laughs> horrifying. Well, I mean, it's they, they're, they're not physically, like, their heads aren't replaced physically. It's oh, yeah. Just... They absolutely are. It's giant sonic shadow and silver heads. <laughs> Attached to the... Onto... <laughs> okay. Yeah, you, you just oh, went into fine. Blender, popped the heads off the models, <laughs> put them onto the other model, made sure... All the rigging is the same. <laughs> okay. If that's what you uh, want. <laughs> no, I don't, but that's what's there. Okay. That is what you've done to me. All right. Okay. So in for a penny, in for a pound. I uh, guess. <laughs> um, oh God. Uh, I imagine that the hedgehog Ghidorah, would be a comedy of errors for a bit and King Ghidorah would be wiping the floor with them until they all discover the superpower of teamwork, get their act together 
and then do what they do against golden godlike forms and save the day. <laughs> they become super hedgehog Ghidorah. No oh, lord. <laughs> And then Eggman laughs because here comes Metal Sonic Ghidorah and just, uh, no, <laughs> no. So what? Metal Sonic, uh, Silver Sonic, and who's the third head? Tails Doll? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> we will do that because that is the worst answer. I mean, it's just Metal Overlord again. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Godzilla. All I, I know is that the Crush tu- Crush 40 tune that's playing in the background kicks. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course it does. It's a cover of uh, Godzilla by uh, Blue Oyster Cult. Sure, why not? Because why not? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Next question is from Ticos. Did Sega have anything to do with the naming of Floral Forest Village? Is it the official name of the place where Cream's House is, or is this only applicable to IDW? No, that was all me, and we'll see. Um, Normally I would say, yeah, it's just a comic location. Don't get too attached to it. But we've seen small elements of the book get referenced in other places. Nothing huge, but stuff like Blaze's teacup at the end of Metal Virus being used in the Japanese Twitter art, which just blows my mind. Like that level of recognition alone, it's a small thing, but that's leagues between what we had in the Archie days. So I don't know, maybe floral forest will become a thing. I ain't going to hold my breath waiting, but uh, I don't know. Maybe who knows next up question from Johnny be good. What would Bivalve the Clam look like if he got a Mobian redesign like Akluk? <sighs> Clamshell with googly eyes and noodle limbs sticking out, or something more elaborate? Would the surface world ever be safe again if Bivalve gained the capacity to walk and manipulate tools? Why, why, why are you doing this to me today, guys? First we got Nightmare Triple Hedgehog-Headed Ghidorah, <laughs> and now we've got Mobian Bivalve. <laughs> And see, this, what's horrible is I'm doing this to myself. Because you say googly eyes. That'd be funny. <laughs> yeah. I'm just imagining that the clam opens up and the pseudopod within stretches out to make this big, gooey, pink, vaguely Mobian form. And the shell becomes like a helmet on its head. So it's this kind of low render rubber man that's <laughs> kind of walking around. And I hate it. That's... I hate that you made me think of this. That's 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 horrifying <laughs> it absolutely that's a, is i'm that's nightmare fuel holy crap i'm going to go to bed tonight thinking of this because of you <laughs> why do you make me think of these things where is john gray to make to draw this to make this a reality no 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 john <laughs> if you are listening do not this is not a joke prompt do not I will find you. I will cross the border. They will not stop me. Do not. (laughs) Next up, Mike B. This question will likely put your nostalgia memory to the test. What's the... (laughs) What is the weirdest VHS tape you ever watched as a kid? Think of, like, stuff from Everything is Terrible... As a way to jog your childhood memories or nightmares. Bonus points if it's not a well-known movie or show. Even more bonus points if it's edutainment or religious. Okay. I was thinking about this for a bit, and it was hard to nail down anything, because most of the VHS tapes we had were either, like, Disney stuff, or they were the tapes that my folks made for TV specials. So, you know, Christmas specials or holiday specials. They would all be just be recorded and we would have these VHS tapes of like eight hours of various cartoons and stuff that had been watched so many times that the quality was garbage. But I think the one that might fit the bill was I don't even remember what it was called, but it was a dinosaur special because I mean, dinosaurs. Come on now. Yeah. And the premise is a kid has a report to do about dinosaurs and doesn't want to do it 
and he has this dream about dinosaurs, which inspires him to write this big report. And then the final segment is that report in the classroom. And it goes from live action to a animated sequence that is very 80s rock that I can probably still sing from memory a little bit because I have no taste to a segment where it's these uh, sculptures with realistic textures and they pan the camera around and they add in sound effects to give the implication of a T-Rex stalking down something and eating it. And so there's a lot of sharp jump cuts between rustling bushes and you hear animals screaming and you hear stomping and tearing noises. And then the last shot is the T-Rex looming over the desecrated corpse with the meat hanging out of its mouth. That messed me up as a kid. Mm -hmm. And then the final sequence, the kid is narrated by somebody else entirely. And the whole thing is claymation. It jumps all over the bloody place. (laughs) And speaking about it out loud, it's like, yeah, that sounds like a really bad trip. But I watched it a bunch because aside from the nightmare sequence, it was really cool. And it was about dinosaurs. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the the thing I remember was the I just remember the weird one of the weirdest things, but also something I watched over and over was the Donkey Kong Country uh, VHS promo tape that Nintendo Power sent out. I don't <laughs> know. I don't know what it was about it. It's a pretty it's a pretty well known thing at this point. Like it's a, it's it's been memefied into the ground at this point. But like at the time, it was like holy crap. Like it, it, it did. It was kind of interesting because it gave some like background insight into video game development, which I hadn't really seen at the time. It wasn't wasn't like today where you get a lot of there's a lot of documentaries and there's a lot more information just out there in general. I mean, this was before I had access to the internet anyway, so it was kind of like, what? Wow, this is really cool to see how they're actually like <laughs> making video games. But also, it was like a super duper '90s cheesy. Just insane, stupid thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, but I got to, you, you could see, like, you got, a, you got a little bit of a glimpse of how they made, they modeled Donkey Kong and then converted him into a sprite to use in the in the game itself. So oh, that was, cool. that was cool. But, I mean, that's just little glimpses of things surrounded by just this absolutely over-the-top 90s, super rad dude <laughs> who was hosting host of everything and uh you know he couldn't get into uh nintendo's treehouse even though he knew the password because they wouldn't let him in because i don't know why no donkeys club yeah i guess except the password was diddy <laughs> uh, yeah yeah that's that's that was definitely something that's like the most something thing I remember of as a kid is weird VHS tapes. I'm sure there were more, but that's the one that sticks out the most in my mind. Humor me for a second. Let me see if I can remember this. Okay. <clears throat> Give me a Mesozoic mind. Take me away from all mankind. You can keep your Cenozoic, but I need that Mesozoic. Give me a Mesozoic mind. I'm pretty sure that was the chorus. <laughs> nice. Congratulations. With more synth. Well, yeah, of course. And neon. Well, yeah, it was the 80s, I'm assuming. <laughs> or at least the early 90s. <laughs> I don't know. Go on YouTube. See if you can find Mesozoic Mind. See what that turns up. I'm curious. Yes, yes. Ian can sing, folks. He's He's... He's not half bad. He's not half bad. I was better back in the day. <laughs> Next question is from Blue Mickey Mouse. Are you supplied with notes to why game character designs became what they were? I hear it's some sort of recurring argument of whether Blaze is supposed to be themed Arab or Indian, or forehead jewel to equate to a Hindu bindi for the latter. And then furthermore, there's speculation around what is seen with the Babylon Rogue's ancestry and if that ties into Blaze's universe. No, I have no insight into that whatsoever. Alrighty then. Next question is from Piggy Bank. 
We all know Sonic the Hedgehog is an immensely successful and perfect franchise, <laughs> which makes it all the more surprising that in almost 30 years that he's been around, this famous blue hedgehog has yet to enter the world of comic books. If you were looking from the outside in on the creation of the first ever Sonic the Hedgehog comic book series set to release its first issue this year, who would you love to see involved with it that you believe could help make some fun comics? Maybe a favorite writer, artist, webcomic creator, comic studio, director, storyteller, an inspiring person, a pet dog, or whatever. Also, bonus points for both of you if you only name people who have not already been involved with any of the actual Sonic comics. Also, Ussel, no naming yourselves. I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can either. <laughs> not really. I mean, I've been I've been neck deep for 15 years. I I honestly cannot remove myself from a world with Sonic books. I I don't think I can conceptualize. That. I know what you're going for, but <laughs> I honestly don't I don't know. I don't know anyone who writes books of this nature that i could i i have been part of the process for so long that we are it we are the example and you don't really check out mentioned in the way of fan comics or anything because of possible legal issues so it's not like you could point and say yeah yeah, they'd be good or something like that necessarily it's not like there's a lot of you know anything contemporary with sonic out there in (laughs) I mean, there's other licensed books that IDW does, right? I haven't sampled them enough to say, oh, yes, it would be great if so-and-so from this licensed book were to give Sonic <laughs> a pass. So, I don't know. I, I can't remove myself. I am inexorably linked with the Little Blue Hedgehog. Mm. Rob Liefeld's Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> <laughs> Stew on that for a while. <laughs> <sighs> The issues would be incredibly delayed, first of all. Like, more than they already have been. Or if Frank Miller wrote it. It'd just be called Frank Miller Hog. <laughs> Chris Claremont's S-Men? Yes. I'm just tailing all these from the chat now. <laughs> uh, uh, then have the Mike Judge Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> Now that would be interesting. <laughs> Hog of the hill, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just stealing these from the chat now because I can't think of any either. I'm just like, uh... <laughs> oh man, I don't know. That fox ain't right. That's right. <laughs> All right, let's go on to this question from Professor Rye before this gets ridiculous. What's your favorite kind of sandwich? Oh, wait, never mind. It's ridiculous again. (laughs) No, no, no. This is a pertinent question. Well, true, 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 true. Uh, Used to be peanut butter and jelly was my go-to, but apparently I can't process that anymore, so. What? (sighs) I guess I I don't know, man. Are you allergic to peanuts now? I don't know. Or is it something else? I don't know, but it used to be my go-to, and now it feels like somebody's stabbing me with a screwdriver, so I have to... No longer partake in the PB and J. No. Uh, I don't know. A good deli sandwich is nice. Nice grilled cheese, with or without bacon, either or. Oh man, I remember when I worked at Safeway. Terrible job, by the way. I don't recommend working in a grocery store. I don't recommend working mm. retail. Like, <laughs> if you can avoid it, don't work retail. <laughs> and I'm someone who is actually pretty good at the customer service side of it, but. Still, it's it's just a it's just terrible. But they had a there was a deli sandwich. I'm trying to remember exactly what it was made out of, but they had like they used a pickled mozzarella and that was really good and it was like a I think it was on chicken. I don't know, it's been years since I've had it, but man it was really good and that that's that's a favorite of mine for sure. Um mm. I'm trying to remember. It's like I mean, a sub it's like a sub sandwich type thing, but with uh, pickled mozzarella and like t- like chicken. And uh, let's see what else. What other sandwiches do I like? I don't know. I like a good ham and turkey. It's always good. When the world gets back on track and the X comes back to Toronto, there's like this giant food building with 
innumerable stalls. And the one that I always make sure to hit every time, they always get like a huge corner booth, is a shaved smoked meat on rye with just a bit of mustard. Oh, it is exquisite. They pile it on so thick that you have to smash it down just to fit it in your face. It is exquisite in its simplicity. My mouth is watering at the thought of it. Mm, I, lo- I do love a good pastrami and mustard. And that, for some reason, pastrami and mustard. That speaks to me. That's that's a good one. Now, when you were up here... Yeah, we had pea meal. Yeah, the pea meal sandwich. Mm-hmm. That's just... That was good. That's just good. That's it's very good. Just, that's all there is to it. It's just good. It's good eating right there. <laughs> meat on bread in face that's the equation for a good sandwich that's what I want in a sandwich yes bread meat and in my mouth I also like uh, hamburgers are hamburgers a sandwich <laughs> see I was debating that I mean it is meat and cheese in bread <laughs> what's the difference between you know a turkey club there, there isn't a burger really when you get down to it there but, isn't I think uh, it comes down to the type of bread, maybe. The a, thickness a, of A meat. burger is a sandwich, as is a hot dog. I'm going to get into it. I'm going to open that can of worms. <laughs> uh, a hot dog <laughs> on a bun. That's also a sandwich. It is. It is meat within bread. Yes. That's the only requirement. <laughs> a hot dog is not a taco. <laughs> no. 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 Because a taco is a cornmeal shell that's completely different yeah or at least a, f- a flour like flat flour thing that's folded over you don't f- fold over a hot dog you don't fold over a hot dog fold it into my mouth <laughs> oh this show oh this show and then we got one last question here <gasps> this 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 show's just silly this show's just silly <sighs> here's this one from dove to close us out Oh no, the Mario brothers are fighting. Luigi is tired of Mario taking the spotlight. Mario is tired of having to carry his brother through every adventure. Ian, Kyle, Mario versus Luigi, Battle of the Brothers. Who wins this epic showdown? Please show your work. It's Luigi. You know why it's Luigi? Why is it Luigi? Because Mario is the average. Mario is the everyman. Luigi has other Luigi has all of Mario's Mario's abilities and more. He Maybe. has he has the higher jump and a, a longer floating time with it. He has more um I would say his more more drive to be better than his brother because he's the little brother and he's tired of being overshadowed by his big brother. He also has a really really good uh angry face as we've seen in <laughs> Mario Kart 8. <laughs> when he gets mad, he gets mad. <laughs> and I almost want to say there are more games about Luigi rescuing Mario than there are Mario rescuing Luigi. Correct. But those are all Mario having been overpowered by another force. It is not necessarily Luigi that is the deciding factor. It's just Mario is no longer in the equation. Now we have to go with option B. And Mario may be the everyman, but he is one of the most athletic and powerful everyman that you will ever find. He's usually the solo hero because that's all you need. He gets the job done. Yeah, but Luigi Luigi's... can literally do everything Mario can do is kind of the thing. Like he he has yeah. all of Mario's abilities. And then he has to make up for them by adding additional quirks and stuff. Yeah, and by trying to separate himself from his brother, you know? I don't is know. that the drive, or is that the underlying knowledge that he doesn't measure up? That he knows Mario is inherently the superior brother? <sighs> Man, it's... it's. Hmm. All right, so this is what we're going to do. Yeah, okay. Everyone Go who's ahead. listening to the show, boot up your copy of Smash Brothers. Level 9 Mario and Luigi, computer controlled, final destination, no items, five <laughs> stock. Let us know what your results are. Yes, leave them in the comments below. Or hit us hit us on Twitter or something. Just let us know. In the meantime, someone's hitting a clown horn outside. <laughs> <laughs> what a perfect way to cap off this show. 
<laughs> Pretty loud. I can hear it through my headphones. My headphones are closed back. So, yeah. It's the clowns, Kyle. They've come for you. <laughs> clowns have come, finally. Jeez, take me away. Yes. <laughs> Especially after this this poop show. <laughs> Instead of the Jaws theme, it's a bike horn. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can't sleep. Clowns will eat me. Actually, I'm kind of hoping they will eat me. They just put me out of my misery. <laughs> well, before we feed Kyle to the clowns, we're going to give a big thank you to everyone who makes this show possible. Big thank you to patrons and Kofi donators that are Daniel H, Alex P, James K, John B, Jennifer R, Samuel P, Sam Cybercat, Robotnik Holmes, Mike B, Justin G, Torchbound, Coupling Crew 128, Duas, Diz, Din, Diane W, Scarfy Matt, Andrew D, Chris A, John M, Don B, Yami M, Sony, Lee H, K, Sin, Fritz, Lisa M, Chevelle, Salute, Cat, Silly String, Noni. <sighs> Dave M, Blue Title Gamer, Justin S, Bradley TT, Tick Tick, Supercalifragilistic, Papa Drippadopolis, Final Neil, J Frost, Dagama F, Wow, Ogilvy, Maurice, Jonathan L, Jonathan D, Rachel W, PC, The Unicorn, Godzilla, Chaos Universe, Sonic Legacy, Piggy Bank, Hero of the Light 13, Pen Dolce, Preston N, Dabbler the Dalek, Daniel B, Glitchiest Dove, Owen B, D, Sony N, Jib, Jonathan W, Red the Super Namix, FR, Scarletta, Turbo, Red Wolf, Chase L, Flixy, Crooker, Saturn Flicky, Scurvy Pirate Hog, and Madeline M. Thank you, thank you, everybody, for supporting whatever this is. <laughs> this last two weeks have just been it's been some a weird line of episodes we've got going on here. <laughs> as long as they're entertained, it's fine. Yes, yes, it's I fine. suppose. I suppose. I suppose. We're gonna people find you on the internet, Ian. Go to Twitter at Ian Flynn BKC. Find my personal website, BumbleKing.com, where you can access the Bumble Comic Shop and get yourself a signed book by me. Or head over to my original series with Adam Bryce Thomas. That's Drogoon, D-R-O-G-U-N-E dot com. Kyle, what about you? You can find me on Twitter at KyleJCRB, where I am much more eloquent and succinct than I am on this show. <laughs> you can find me, also find me over at KNGI.org. That is where you find the archived episodes of the Bumblecast, an MP3 downloadable format for your listening pleasure. You can also find all the podcast feed links and everything there as well. And you can also find my other show, Nitro Game Injection, which you can listen to streaming live on Fridays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. That shows all about video game music and video game music remixes. So be sure to check that out. Follow the show on Twitter at Bumblecast. Contact us at Bumblecast at Yahoo.com. And listen to us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube Music, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, our YouTube channel, and KNGI.org. And also, go check out the Bumble Store and get you some Bumble gear at shop.spreadshirt.com slash Bumble Store. That has all sorts of items to uh, deck out your, your, your home and yourself. So do it. Like, Bumble everything. You, you, need, you need all the Bumble in your life. So go over there and get some. Also, Cash Bumblecast Gaming live streaming on YouTube. That's youtube.com backslash Bumble King videos, Sundays at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. And that's it. That's it. That's enough. Uh, Take care of each other. Enough. Take care of yourselves. We'll see you next week for more Bumblecasty goodness. Uh, is it good, though? Is it goodness? It's goodness. Well, goodness me. They're entertained. Goodness me. Entertained. Goodness me. I'm not even tired. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me. Everything is wrong with me. It's just a just a day. Oh, what a day. Are you hitting the microphone? No. Something is. <laughs> hmm. Something is hitting your microphone. Is it still making noise now? No, not now. But it sounds like blong, blong, or like you're moving it. You're moving it or bonking it. Sorry. I don't know what that is. I don't know. It's weird. Well, let's see if it continues. Okay. This room, as soon as you turn off the fans, the other fans, and the close the door, this room becomes a, like, an oven somehow. Mm. I don't know why. Mm. It's the master bedroom. you think that would be trying to make that the coolest room in the house. But uh, it's not. <laughs> um, 
And yes, I do in fact have my computer room in the master bedroom. And our bedroom is in the secondary bedroom. Because the biggest room should be dedicated to the most important thing. And the most important thing is not the bed. Well, no. I need I need all the space for the computers for our and office. You do is you, you know, sleep there. Yeah, that's pretty you much it. Collapse, reboot, leave, and then leave. Yeah, I don't need to stay in there. <laughs> it's a big, big ass room for no reason. I don't need a room that big to sleep in. <laughs> Unless you're hosting a very interesting party. Yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't host any parties. Screw that. I don't have time for parties. You've been listening to The Bumblecast, a co-production of Bumble King Comics and the KNGI Network. Original theme music composed by Ken Coda Snyder. Remixed intro by T-Lopes. Find out more information, along with podcast feeder links, MP3 downloads, and more at bumbleking.com and kngi.org. Who would win? King Ghidra of King of the Monsters. <laughs> like KOTM. The KOTM. 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 What is KOTM? KOTM. <laughs> oh, my brain. My brain. <sighs> what is wrong with me today? Do you need an influx of caffeine? I, I've had an influx of caffeine. I just, I need an influx of, I don't know. Do you need a defibrillator? <laughs> <laughs> I need an influx of the the good uh, the good things that uh, are in your brain, you know, what's it called? Endorphins. No, the other thing. Adrenaline. No. Heroin. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> dopamine. Yes. Ah, dopamine. Yeah, probably. Yeah, or whatever it is that uh, SSRIs help with. Anyway. <laughs> Sour Skittles. Yeah, that might help. <laughs> uh, serotonin. Yeah, that too. Dopamine, serotonin, all of it. Just give, give, give me all of that. Give it all to me. SSRI. I can remember SSRI, but serotonin, I can't remember, even though serotonin <laughs> is literally part of the acronym SSRI. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh can't read. I can't do anything right. I'm sorry. You're good. You're good. Okay. I had. To, I probably do. Valerie, I've got something probably. I mean, it's not a tumor.